<laughs> if you have your Bibles with you or a pew Bible, I'll be speaking a little on John chapter 15. And uh, it's a very familiar passage. It's not... Uh, Like most scriptures, it's harder to live than it is to understand. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the first six verses and then expound on those. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that, or prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, it except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Before we uh, look into it further, let's just uh, try to get a grasp on the before and after, and where this is actually taking place. Um, it doesn't tell us particularly in Scripture but he has just been with his disciples in the upper room. They've had their supper. He's washed their feet. And now I, th I think that this is happening as they journey to the garden where he prays. And he knows what's ahead of him. But he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about his disciples and just... He knows that their biggest trial in their faith is coming very shortly because he is going to the garden. From there, he's being betrayed and then he's going to the cross and they are going to face something which they have never had to face before. So he is in his greatest Stress, he is still thinking of his disciples, not about himself, because they need to go on after he's no longer here. So, what is all going through the disciples' minds, I don't know, but they know that one of them isn't with them as they walk to the garden. Because in the upper room, after Jesus had given the sop to Judas, Judas went out for to betray him. So they know that one isn't with them, and they don't know what lies ahead of them. So he, he admonishes them to stay in him. And I was just thinking of, uh, the word was just so... Uh, came alive to me this morning as Jake was saying how he would, he wanted to go, I'm, I hope this is okay, Jake, sure. that he wanted to go to Montreal and do something for himself. But the Lord had other plans for him. And so uh, he didn't get what he wanted, but he got better. Amen. And that is the way that Jesus works in our lives. He is not, and the pruning that he does, it hurts. Of course it hurts. The pruning in the natural vine will create a scar, but it will heal, and it will bring the vine, pushing the nutrients into the branch, and the branch will produce more fruit because of the pruning. And that is what the Lord is doing with us. He is pruning us in love. And he wants to remove 
the pride, the self-sufficiency, the arrogance that wants to be in us. He wants to prune that out of our lives and take it away so that we can be completely and wholly attached to him. And then he wants fruit, and that's the only reason that anybody prunes a vine, is because the pruning, the suckers, the shoots that are sucking all the nutrients out of the vine, that, that sap is supposed to flow to the fruit so that it can grow and mature. And the excess leaves have to be cut away in that shoot so that the sun can get in to ripen the fruit. And that is what Jesus is doing or what the Father is doing to us. And to produce that fruit, we have to be attached to the vine. He calls us the branches and he wants fruit. So he prunes us and his spirit not only has to flow into us, but it has to flow through us that there can be fruit. So let's just take a look at what, uh, what the fruit is that he expects from us. And for that, we'll flip back to Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What we see here, these are the very characteristics of our Savior. And I've just taken a moment to, to go through these because we, we read these nine virtues that are the fruit of the Spirit. And it doesn't take long to read them, but there's so much involved in it. The first one is love. It should always be at the top because that is the very essence of God and Jesus, love. And love is a sacrificial giving of oneself for the good of others with no thought of what we get in return. And the ultimate example was Christ giving himself on the cross for our sins. Joy. Christ endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. And we joy that Jesus paid the price to set us free. His joy was to sit on the right hand of the Father and to pay, he paid the price and one day he's coming back for us who are his bride. And that will complete his joy. We are to live in peace, to live in harmony with one another, complete trust and confidence that we are God's children. And we, we just heard some, uh, the things that are going on in, in the world, in this country. If we didn't have trust in Jesus, that he has finished the work, how could we have peace? It would destroy us. But in him, we have peace. Long-suffering, forbearance, kindness, not soon angry. Gentleness is kindness as a mother takes care of her infant or her children, as a nurse with her patients, there's 
just a love and a kindness and a gentleness. And goodness is the generosity, always ready to help and morally clean. Faith, to trust God fully, to embrace the truth of the scripture and the inerrancy of it. We can trust them. He has said it, it will come to pass. Meekness, humbleness, even in adversity, and especially when dealing with the arrogant or erring, not rash or harsh. Temperance, self-control, not yielding to sin, but being totally submitted to the, the, to the vine and allowing him to flow in us and through us. This, these nine virtues compose the fruit of the Spirit as one fruit. These aren't gifts. Every Christian should be portraying these virtues. And so my question for myself and for those here, is that what the people around us see? Do they see these virtues in us? Do we ex allow the love of Christ to shine through us in such a way that the unbeliever has a desire to know why we do these things and he wants it in his life. So we'll go back to John now in the and look a little further into verses uh, five and six. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. The same way as the sap flows through the physical grapevine to produce the fruit, the same way we have to be fully and wholly attached spiritually, allow him free reign in our heart and mind and just guide us in every aspect of our life. For without me, you can do nothing. It's so important that we make a full surrender and allow him just as he went he went to the cross he paid a hundred percent of our debt he owns a hundred percent of us not half of it not three quarters and we're not supposed to try to live with one foot with things that are attracting us from the world he wants all of those to be pruned out, that he can live in us, guide us, direct us, that his fruit, the virtues of Jesus Christ will be manifest in us and that the world will see them. The unbeliever, the doubter, that he questions and says, how, how can this be? I knew this man before he met Jesus and he was doing everything that we shouldn't be doing. Now he's a changed man. But he is drawing his nourishment, his sap from the Holy Spirit. 
As a man, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. Who are these branches that do not abide in him? It doesn't tell us particularly, exactly, but we look back as they traveled from the upper room to the garden. There was one missing. There was one that did not abide in the Lord Jesus. He went out and betrayed him. I'm not, if, if there's somebody here who says, you know, that's not the way it is, I'm not going to argue it, but that's what comes to me. And then also, if we go back to Luke in chapter 8, the parable of the sower, and the, after Jesus had spelled out the parable, his disciples asked him, what might this parable be? And he said, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, those by the wayside are they which hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a little while believe, and then in time of trial fall away. And they which fall among the thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. We have to continue. We can't just start and not keep on until as long as we are granted life, we are his. And after that, we are his. Now, I'm looking at the clock. How long? <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, in verse seven. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Does this give us a free reign to ask for whatever we wish? Amen. I want to be a millionaire? No. That's not what it's telling us. It's telling us, if, if ye abide in me, if you are totally committed, and then I will give you what you will, because your will will be in alignment with my will. So, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Love, first center, everywhere. Love has to show forth. And I'll... I'll skip a few verses here. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He was already telling them what is going to happen in the future. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to lay down my life so that you may have life and have it eternally. But this little word, if, always comes back again. Ye, and he says, I lay down, he lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if, if ye do whatsoever I command you. We have heard about the depravity that's going on in this world. And the government seem to be endorsing it. And we have prayed for them, and we have to pray for them. It is the only way things will ever change. We are seeing, and I firmly believe that we are in the latter days. We are seeing earthquakes, wars, famines, floods. But it doesn't tell us to get scared and afraid. It tells us to look up, because our redemption is drawing nigh. Ye have not chosen, sorry, but henceforth I will, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go forth, that you should Go and bring forth fruit, and that your faith should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command, that ye love one another. The love which the world presents to us, they say, if... You have love in you. You're not going to say no to anything. We have a right to decide. And right now, what is happening? People are supposed to be guidance to their children. Yet some of them are saying, we're not even going to name our baby before we know when he he or she grows up what gender they wish to be. How far can we get off the track? This is happening in Canada, in the world. It's in the beginning, in Genesis, when God created man, he said he made them male and he made them female. In his likeness, we created them. He already, Jesus was with him at creation. In our likeness, he said, we created them. Now, we want to recreate what he created in his image and think that that's right. There is no way we have to get away from it. And that has to change but it won't unless the body of believers is strong enough and prays fervently enough that God will intervene and change the hearts of those in power that is the only way it will ever change so In closing, I guess, my question is this. Is the fruit of the Spirit, God's Spirit, living within us so completely that it shines through us, it produces the nine virtues that are actually the image of Christ? 
does that show through us to the point where others are attracted? They want to become believers. They want Christ in their life. It's been challenging for me to do this study and to preach because I looked at myself and I said, you've got a lot to do yet. You have got much to do yet. But as Janet was saying, there is revival happening and my prayer is that revival could start here in Lake St. Peter and in Bancroft and in Maynooth and all the surrounding areas and that we would be here and just with open arms as the Lord Jesus' arms are open that we could meet those people in love wherever they are at whatever stage in life they are and wherever they are spiritually, that we could guide them to the true life, the Lord Jesus.